The internet has allowed game developers to easily update their games post-launch, but that doesn't mean that games didn't get updates before downloadable patches were commonplace. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! is one of the most iconic celebrity video games ever made, right up there with John Madden's Football and Mary-Kate and Ashley's Sweet 16 License to Drive. But if you've ever played the game recently, like via the Switch Online service for example, you'd notice that Mike Tyson is strangely absent from the game. Originally, the game was released in Japan in September 1987 as simply Punch-Out! on a limited edition special gold Famicom cartridge that was only available to people who participated in the Famicom Golf US course tournament. Eventually though, when the game came to North America a month later, it received the Mike Tyson branding. There were a few other changes like grammar and spelling mistakes were fixed, as well as a few color changes, but all in all the games were very similar. In the original Japanese version, the boxer Super Macho Man is the final boss of the game, but when the American version came out, Mike Tyson was added as a brand new super boss. About a month after the American version came out, Japan actually got the Mike Tyson version of the game too. Tyson was a global icon at this point, as he was the heavyweight boxing world champion, so it's no surprise Nintendo released the game in Japan, and eventually in other parts of the world like Europe as well. A little under three years after Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! was released in August 1990, Nintendo actually released a new version of the game simply titled Punch-Out! Huh. Mike Tyson's name isn't in the title, he's not on the box art, oh he isn't even in the game anymore. He's replaced by some dude named Mr. Dream. Mr. Dream has a completely different bio than Mike Tyson, and apparently he comes from Dreamland, but from a gameplay perspective Mr. Dream is a literal clone of Mike Tyson having the exact same patterns and moves. Most likely, the deal Nintendo had with Mike Tyson eventually ended, and for some reason they decided not to renew the agreement. If I had to guess the reason why Nintendo didn't renew the deal? Well, money. The deal Nintendo made with Tyson was most likely in 1986, before Tyson reached the peak of his popularity. If Nintendo and Tyson were to renegotiate, it's very likely Tyson would have asked for far more money than he got for his initial deal. Considering Punch-Out! was already a three-year-old game at this point and well past the point of making big bucks, Nintendo probably decided it wasn't worth it to renew the deal. The Mr. Dream version of Punch-Out! is the version that was used in many of the re-releases of the game on services like Nintendo Switch Online service, meaning unless you have the OG Mike Tyson version on NES, there is no other legitimate way to play Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! When it comes to multiple versions of a game though, you really can't beat Street Fighter 2, released in February 1991. Street Fighter 2 was insanely popular and it practically defined what a fighting game was. Obviously, Capcom had to capitalize off the success. Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition was released about a year after the original in the arcades. Champion Edition added in the boss characters from the original game as playable characters, as well as the ability to have mirror matches with both players using the same character. Because yeah, I guess Back then, Capcom, they just didn't think that anyone would want to play as the same character as their opponent. As Street Fighter 2 became more popular, bootlegs of the game also became more widespread. The most famous of the bootlegs being Street Fighter 2 Rainbow Edition. Rainbow Edition is an insane bootleg made by a Taiwanese hacking group that added in all sorts of broken moves and it also bumped up the game's speed to lightning fast levels. Initially, Capcom wrote off Rainbow Edition as a gimmick, but no one could deny the high speed of Rainbow Edition was addicting. So later in 1992, Capcom released Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting. Hyper Fighting significantly increased the speed of the game and gave new special moves to many of the characters. The next update, Super Street Fighter 2 The New Challengers, was released 9 months later in 1993. This game was the biggest update yet, adding in 4 brand new characters and completely overhauling the graphics. Each character has brand new portraits, sprites are more detailed. Visually, it's just a huge step up. Oh, and the music! The music got a big boost too. This huge leap in quality was because Capcom used completely new arcade hardware. The older versions of Street Fighter 2 used the CP System 1, aka the CPS 1 board, but Super Street Fighter 2 used Capcom's brand new CPS 2 board, which not only made their games better, but also made their games extremely difficult to pirate, thanks to the board's very complex encryption and security systems. 
The only issue with Super Street Fighter 2 was for some reason, the developers decided to remove the crazy speed from hyper fighting and bring the pace back to normal. Fortunately, this drop in speed would not last long because the next and final update for the classic arcade Street Fighter 2, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, was released the following year in 1994. Super Turbo not only made Street Fighter 2, well, Turbo again, bringing back the speed, it introduced a new mechanic, the Super Meter, which when filled allows you to do an ultimate move called a Super Combo. And it also added in a brand new secret character, Akuma, who can only be used via an absurdly complex cheat code. Now, if you thought that was the end of Capcom updating Street Fighter 2, oh no no no, we got a ton of other updates, like Super Street Fighter 2 X for Matching Service released in 2000, a Japanese exclusive version of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo for the Dreamcast. This version allowed you to fight online with other players. This game also added in the more powerful version of Akuma from the Street Fighter Alpha series, Shinakuma as a playable character. Super Street Fighter 2 X for matching service is somewhat rare as it was only available on Sega's online store called Sega Direct. Then we also got Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo Revival for the Game Boy Advance in 2001, which made Akuma and Shinakuma accessible as unlockable characters without cheat codes and it added in some new stage backgrounds. Then we also got Hyper Street Fighter 2 The Anniversary Edition in 2004 for the PS2, which gave players the ability to play as different versions of each character from the various different Street Fighter 2 versions, like you could put Vanilla Street Fighter 2 Guile against Super Turbo DJ. Long story short, Capcom made a ton of updates for Street Fighter 2. In the first part of this series, I talked about a few of the ways the Pokemon games updated without using the internet. But probably the most interesting of Pokemon's updates was the Berry Program update. Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire were released in late 2002 in Japan and in 2003 for the rest of the world. Early versions of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire contain a glitch with the real-time clock included in every copy of the game. The glitch made it so that 366 real-world days after the game is first started, the clock will reset the day number. This caused calendar-based events like berry growth and weather conditions to be frozen. They would remain frozen for another year until the game made it to day 367. Obviously, this was a big problem, so Nintendo offered to fix the glitch for free if you sent your copy into them. While the North American version of the page is down, on the Japanese Nintendo site, they actually still have the page regarding support for the glitch dated all the way back on December 3rd, 2003. In September 2016, 13 years later, Nintendo updated this page to say that repair support ended. I wonder if a couple of people tried to send in their old Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire copies to Nintendo like 10 years after the games came out, so Nintendo decided to officially end the service so they wouldn't have to put up with the hassle. If you didn't want to send in your copy to Nintendo, there actually were several other ways to fix the berry glitch. Pokemon Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Emerald were all included with copies of a patch called the Berry Program Update. So for example, if you connect your GBA with a copy of Pokemon Ruby to a GBA with a copy of Pokemon Fire Red via link cable, the glitch would be fixed in your Pokemon Ruby copy. Pokemon Colosseum and Pokemon XD Gill of Darkness for the GameCube also had the update. There actually were a ton of official methods Nintendo offered to fix the glitch, like these Berry Program Update e-reader cards. So to their credit, Nintendo really did want to make sure this glitch was fixed. It's quite interesting as this was one of the only times I can remember that Nintendo officially acknowledged the existence of a glitch in one of their games. Later releases of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire had the glitches already fixed, so your childhood copy may or may not have the berry glitch. Well, it was fun talking about old game updates. I'll probably make another video in this series in the future.